it gives me a great pleasure tonight to introduce to you an evening with an associate uh, professor. Uh, he, he just recently retired from North Greenville College. An evening with Mr. Scott Rithra. Thank you. I, I've worked at North Greenville part-time for 15 or so years, and then I uh, also uh, uh, worked at Cal Penn's National Battlefield, too, as a, as a park ranger for a number of years, and I enjoyed that. Uh, just left that a few years ago, too. Did some of those at the same time. Uh, uh, worked some days at North Greenville and some at uh, Cal Penn's. Well, my family, I do have a cold tonight, and I didn't want to miss this, though, so if I have to stop and drink some liquid, I hope you understand, uh, but I'm going to try to try to make it, and uh, uh, I know many of you have Scotch-Irish ancestry. Uh, I do, through the Withrows. My family was originally uh, Anglo-Saxon from England. And somehow, I think they had a disagreement with the king, which happened often, and they went north and settled near Glasgow, uh, Scotland, uh, and became uh, maybe married with more Celtic people, I don't know, but um, Scotch-Irish, Scotch they are mixed. There's sometimes some Celtic, but Anglo-Saxon, and maybe some uh, Viking, too. But, uh, of course, we went to Ireland, and Northern Ireland and then came to America. We think Robert and Jeanette Withrow came to Chester County, Pennsylvania in 1718. We're not, we can't find the uh, ship they sailed on. We can't find that list. But if they did, that's what, 300 years, my math serves me right. Uh, and some of my family, and I may have to pull money out of savings, but I intend to go in 2018. I've got a cousin in Raleigh who she's really a good researcher. Of course, she's near the archives there, and she's established some contacts with some Withrows who are still in Northern Ireland. So uh, we, we're going to have a light plan when we, when we get there. Uh, which is correct, Scots-Irish or Scotch-Irish? I like Scotch-Irish. Uh, <laughs> that's a more traditional use in the United States. Now, some people say the Scots-Irish has come back from Europe and here and considered more correct, but uh, um, I belong to the Scotch-Irish Society, and they won't use the term Scots-Irish. They say Scotch-Irish is the right one, and they, they're going to stick by it. <clears throat> so either they will, if somebody writes a paper for their journal, uh, they can quote somebody who said Scots Irish, but in their uh, notes, but they don't title anything that way. Uh, did you know the story that English set up a plantation of of border Scots and some English over in Ireland? to control the native Irish. Very little intermarriage, if, if any. There's uh, some disagreement over that, but probably not much, if any. Uh, they took the name Irish because that's where they lived the last. And then when they came to America, the people called them Irish because that's where they lived last. But they were Scots. Uh, they were Scotch. And, uh, or, or English, along that border area between Scotland and in England. Uh, in fact, they didn't call them Irish, so they called them Irish. I grew up in western North Carolina, and that's what we called a potato. An Irish potato. <laughs> that was the pronunciation. Of course, the Scotch-Irish speech became the speech pattern of the Piedmont, especially in the Appalachians and into the west, Arkansas and other places. Um, the Great Wagon Road, many of them like my family, I can trace my family to Chester County, to uh, 
where um, Gettysburg is now, Adams County today. Um, some were west into Fort Loudoun, Pennsylvania, Frank Franklin County, Cum maybe Cumberland Valley, um, that area. Some came on down into Virginia, near Lexington and uh, Stanton, Virginia. Uh, came on down to, uh, some were near Big Lick, which is Roanoke, was Roanoke. Uh, some came on down, my family came on down to uh, Rowan County near Salisbury, North Carolina, and then to Rutherford County, North Carolina, where, where I grew up. My fourth grandfather, James, we got more James than you can shake a stick at. Uh, the naming pattern, you know, James and then James, James, and my grandfather was James, my great-great-grandfather. Uh, and my, my fourth grandfather, James, fought at the Battle of Kings Mountain. He was a captain. He was one of the over-mountain men. He and the... Um, some of Charles McDowell's men ambushed um, a contingent of Ferguson's men at a place called Cane Creek in Rutherford County. And um, they had to leave and find refuge across the mountains at the Over Mountain settlement. So they came back across with the Over Mountain marchers to fight at the Battle of uh, Kings Mountain. We have nothing of his from that, you know, that era. That's so, so long ago, and people didn't always know to save things in either, you know. The Great Wagon Road was a transportation corridor that many of the Scotch-Irish came down. It was a, um, a settlement corridor, people settling and transportation. It, it went both ways, didn't it, eventually? Uh, they hauled, uh, Conestoga wagons were the freight wagons, and they hauled uh, merchandise on that uh, wagon road. It went both ways. It went north and south, but mainly the settlement came south, and that's the way my family came. Um, it crossed the Potomac River uh, southwest of Gettysburg, entered the Valley of Virginia, and if you've ever been down Interstate 81, or up Interstate 81 in Virginia, highway, uh, U.S. Highway 11 in Virginia, it sort of curves under and over and around and parallel to uh, um, 81. That's pretty much the Great Wagon Road. Now some it deviates in places. Uh, there were alternate routes. Uh, my, my wife and I just got back not too long ago from uh, following the Oregon Trail. And the Oregon Trail along the Platte River was, I mean, it's a real wide area, and there were numbers of routes because of that wide area. Uh, the, the Great Wagon Road was between the Blue Ridge and the Alleghenies in the Valley of Virginia. So, you know, you didn't have too big of a wide area, but they had some alternate routes there. One might be better in wet weather, and one in rainy weather, or whatever. And uh, so that was that was it. Of course, now um, coming from Philadelphia down here, it was all downhill, wasn't it? Right. Wasn't it downhill? That coming to the Carolinas from up there. I think there was some uphill and downhill. When, when it got to Big Lick, Roanoke, it came across the Blue Ridge, there's certainly a bad place there called Maggoty Gap. And you're coming on into uh, Martinsville, Virginia area, and down into the Piedmont of North Carolina. So there were some uphills and, and down. It became a drover's road too, driving stock along the Great Wagon Road. Uh, early part of the Great Wagon Road, you know, I see it as being in, improved more and more as people came south because it was the warrior's path at first. And uh, there were areas in the Shenandoah or the James River Valley that were mostly prairie-like area of grassland. You got into Rowan County, there were prairie-like area. Uh, up around Charlotte and Chester County, that area, uh, grassland. and and. 
buffalo and elk and bear and deer uh, in many of these places until they were all killed out. Uh, goes for 800 miles from Philadelphia to uh, North Augusta. Of course, there were branches that went to Camden and on to Charleston, too. And, and of course, the Wilderness Road left off near Roanoke and went into Kentucky. And you know who's famous uh, Boone for mm -hmm. the Wilderness Road and, and others. Uh, what are some of the Scotch-Irish settlements along the uh, Wagon Road? Do you know some names of them? Maybe in South Carolina? One where uh, Bannister Tarleton massacred some people up off Highway 9 beyond Chester. Have you heard of that area? Waxhaws, yeah. The Battle of the Waxhaws, yeah. The, the cry at Cowpens was, remember the Waxhaw. That was a big Scotch-Irish settlement along the Great Wagon Road. Um, you get down into uh, Abbeville. You know, I think Pickens, seems like Andrew Pickens was in the Waxhaws and he, his family went on down to the Abbeville area. Some of the Calhouns, uh, John C. Calhoun family and others, uh, their, his aunt Patrick Calhoun moved there, their family. Uh, uh, there was a massacre of some of the Calhouns down uh, that way too. Uh, big settlement. Uh, I like this book, Carolina Cradle, uh, in Rowan County, North Carolina. There was a settlement there called the Irish Settlement, and there's a Withrow Creek there. That was after my, my family who settled there. So I know where that creek is still there today. Of course, the highway people got it misspelled, but uh, other than that, it's okay. I've told them. <laughs> they got it Winthrow with an N in it. I don't have an N in my name. But uh, this is a good little book on the, that settlement area and the Great Wagon Road. <clears throat> Here's another book I like, The Great Valley Road of Virginia. Uh, later, these roads became turnpikes. They charged people to travel them, and uh, that was called the Valley Pike later on. Um, and this is a really good one uh, uh, by uh, the late Park Rouse Jr. This is the standard here, the Great Wagon Road. When I was with the Living History Farm at Roper Mountain Science Center, I did a program on the Great Wagon Road. And we had about 75 to 100 people. So, um, and uh, Park Rouse came and uh, spoke. Uh, Dr. Bobby Moss was living then. He came and spoke. Um, somebody from Western Carolina University. And uh, we had some great speakers that day. Uh, but he, he was uh, 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 went to college at Washington and Lee University, which is in Lexington. Uh, the first, of course, it was just Washington College or I think some academy before then, but that was the first institution of higher learning along the Great Wagon Road. Uh, so, there are all these uh, alternate routes and tributary roads coming in and uh, uh, Drovers Road, sometimes they transported produce or whiskey or whatever on some of these roads. Um, and uh, Scotch-Irish were known for a number of things. First of all, they usually settled on the frontier, didn't they? Now, it used to be said that they settled there because they just liked that. It was more like the hills of Scotland. And the Germans settled in the limestone lands of uh, Pennsylvania because that was more like the Rhine River Valley. There may be some truth to that, but the big truth is that the Germans and Quakers already had the best land. So the Scotch Irish were forced to the frontier, uh, relegated to the frontier, and they became a buffer uh, against the Indians on the frontier. And all true pretty much. They sort of hopscotched with the Germans 
coming down the Great Wagon Road. You would have a German community and then a Scotch, of course, by their religion, Germans Reformed or Lutheran and Scotch Irish Presbyterian communities. Uh, they brought with them a certain size of their building from Ireland, which was made of stone, the, the knowledge of that, called a cabin. They spelled it with, I think, two B's, C A D D I. Certain slightly rectangular measurements. Well, they got very adaptable, the Scotch Irish. They got to America and they learned from the Swedes and the Germans and others how to use logs to make the cabins. Same, same shape, usually. Uh, I mentioned the language. They took a German uh, gun and developed the Pennsylvania long rifle, and uh, I guess it was modified some to become the Kentucky rifle uh, later. And they used these rifles at Kings Mountain. And they never had had the bagpipe like the Highland Scots. They did have a border pipe, smaller, uh, as I understand, bagpipe. But it was easier by that time to bring a fiddle. So the fiddle was a big instrument. Of course, you know the difference between a violin and a fiddle. A, a violin has strings, and a fiddle has strings. So that's, they had fiddles. They didn't have violins. They played them as, as fiddles. Strings versus strings. Uh, Charlotte, North Carolina was a big uh, Scotch-Irish area, Mecklenburg County. Um, and, uh, you know, Cornwallis called it a hornet's nest later when he was there. Uh, of course, they were prominent in the American Revolution. Uh, the Prime Minister of England said, Cousin America has run off with a Presbyterian parson. <laughs> and uh, Andrew Jackson's mother advised him on how to have him handle challenges to his reputation or honor. He says, always handle them cases yourself. Don't go through a court of law. Just handle those things yourself. James Logan was a... Scotch Irishman himself, but he was a Quaker. There were a few Quaker Scotch Irish, and he was a secret secretary to the uh, Penn family in Pennsylvania. He said, "The settlement of five families from Ireland gives me more trouble than fifty of any other people." <laughs> so they were. I guess my family was known for its contentiousness, and uh, but they were trying to survive. Uh, really on the frontier. And uh, they fought and traveled. Uh, during the Revolution, some of the battles were along or fought on the Great Way. Right? Now, Daniel Morgan, I worked at Calpin, and Daniel Morgan was, uh, well, actually born in within New Jersey, or Pennsylvania, but he moved early to Winchester, Virginia, in the area. And so he grew up right along the Great Wagon Road, or, or lived along. Uh, whether he'd ever been down to Calpians this far south, we don't think so. But a uh, Scotch Irishman, Dennis Trammell, showed you where the Calpians was. He knew the area. So uh, he put up a stand there against the British. After the Battle of Calpians, uh, you know, Morgan had sciatica really bad, bad uh, after the battle, and he went back to Winchester. Um, and But Tarleton escaped the battle and met with Cornwallis up on Turkey Creek over in, uh, what is today, uh, I think York County. And they went after uh, Morgan and Nathaniel Green. Uh, um, Morgan then left um, and went on, went on back to Virginia, but Green led um, Cornwallis, Tarleton back with him, on a chase to the Dan River, separating North Carolina and Virginia, essentially. And uh, 
they travel part of the great wagon road. Uh, uh, Green uh, crossed the Yadkin River. Um, um, I believe it was Island Ford, I've forgotten right now, but uh, when Tarleton got there, it was more in flood stage. He had to go upstream and cross at Shallow Ford. Uh, so, part of the Great Wagon Road. Uh, there were other uh, places where they fought on the Great Wagon Road. Um, I've got an interest in the Great Wagon uh, Musgrove Mill is not on the Great Wagon Road, but a lot of these Scotch-Irish families knew each other. They lived in communities together. And remember, after Musgrove Mill, and, and riding away from Musgrove Mill, those men agreed if they were threatened again to get together. And that was August of uh, 1780, I believe, as I remember. Uh, and then the following October, uh, they did, uh, leading up to the Battle of uh, Teens Mountain, uh, following September. Uh, so, uh, they, they knew each other, they'd been in communities together, some of them did, they'd fought together, um, been on uh, expeditions together uh, against the uh, Cherokee. Um, I've gotten really interested in the uh, Wagon Road in South Carolina. Now, uh, I got this map down at uh, uh, the Fairfield County Museum. It's, it's about the Civil War. It shows uh, Sherman's march through that county. But they tell me that part of the Wagon Road, at least one, one route of it, came through Fairfield County. Uh, right over here near Newberry. There's a place down here called Lyles Ford. Somewhere out in the river here is Henderson Island, where a family lived on an island later on. But, uh, you know, a great map, and there's a portion of the, uh, at least one alternate route that came through Fairfield County. And I looked online today on the internet, and it said this man is walking toward Lyles Ford, crossing the Broad River, then a forward across the river uh, on the Great Wagon Road. Um, so, and then I looked other places. Uh, if you look to the line to the right, they have it going through Newberry, in Newberry County. Mm -hmm. Well, they're either wrong, uh, somebody is, or it was both places. I tend to think there was a route both places they could take. One was an alternate route they could take. So uh, here's the Newberry route, and then in yellow is the other route that maybe came through, through uh, Fairfield County. And here, here's a map of the Great uh, Wagon Road coming down from Philadelphia, um, coming down, uh, cut across to the Piedmont, coming through Charlotte and on down into the Carolinas to uh, Augusta, Georgia, about going everywhere. Somewhere it got down in there and uh, in, uh, it crossed the Cherokee Path would have crossed it coming, you know, east to west up from Charleston, going into Oconee, toward Oconee County uh, too. So. Uh, that's a great wagon road. I've tried to travel it, and uh, what's, what's left of it. I've uh, been up to Virginia a number of times, in Pennsylvania doing family research. Um, and uh, I'm trying to learn more about it here in South Carolina, too. So, yes? Did, did it start out as Indian Trails first? It was, a lot of it was uh, an Indian Trail. I used to think it went right through Salisbury, North Carolina, but somebody tells me, uh, wrote a book on the Great Wagon Road, North Carolina, that it went west of Salisbury, but then they did a, a cut um, over to the trail. There was another trail, the, I think the Okanichi Pass, that came in from toward Petersburg, Virginia, into Salisbury, and so they, they 
it may have been an old trail connecting, but they later made a better cut through. So a lot of these were Indian trails, yeah. I love to get out on old trails. If I know it's a historic road, I'm, I'm satisfied, you know. Whether it's a trail of tears or, you know, wherever. East Georgia Road, right, yeah. I've traveled down that one. Uh, last time I was down here, uh, two or three years ago, I hadn't been to, uh, what's the old Presbyterian church? Fairview. Fairview. I thought I could find it. It's grown up around Fairview. I, 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 I think I finally found it, but I have been to Fairview uh, uh, Church. And it uh, seemed like I met one of the Martins that descended from those families, Fair, Fairview. Because you visited the old Greenville Presbyterian Church. I've been to the old, there are a lot of Revolutionary War and Greys and um, people from, saying from Northern Ireland on their stones. It's near Hodges, isn't it? Hodges, between Hodges. It's, it's just Stone, stone, yeah. I've been to Greenville, old Greenville Presbyterian. A lot of old Presbyterian churches that are around, the stones are getting really old, and there's some good ones left there. And it says Pennsylvania, born in Pennsylvania, or uh, born in uh, Ireland. Um, there's one at uh, the old Waxhaw Presbyterian Church that said uh, this man, his name was John Crockett, Born on uh, a ship at sea in Philadelphia shore, and there's a ship carved on his gravestone. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hope it's still standing. You know. Does anybody have any questions anymore? Who who built the wagon road? If you're going through woods and everything, you've got to cut down trees and, and all that. And if the wagons get through, somebody had to do some construction. I would think some of the. Uh, well, well, these areas were settled, uh, I, I guess, as they went along. I never have thought of it exactly that way, but um, people I know early in the Carolinas had responsibilities for certain sections. Now, well, now the initial were, cutting might may have been the people, you know, who went first. Just gradually got wider and wider. Well, for their benefit. For their benefit. It's sort of like Daniel Boone going through the Cumberland Gap yeah. with his they didn't have as many axemen, but I see them getting out. And but when they started the turnpikes, those were people that said, I'll do this work and keep this clear, but you're going to have to pay to get through. Right. The turnpikes were, were paying like the, the what? The loop turnpike around. here, yeah. loop around. Um, and uh, some people avoided the turnpikes. They call it shun piking. If they could find a way around, they shunned it. They ran around the turnpikes and didn't have to pay. Of course, all these were used in the Civil War, too, by the wagon roads. Just a uh, quick question. You know, after, after the, during the Revolution War, toward the end and afterwards, there were a lot of, a lot of migration to South Carolina <coughs> and also a lot of migration into the Tennessee and Kentucky area. What was the reason that, that, that some went to South, south, west. Was there any particular reason that caused that? I think sometimes friends, family groups, yeah. uh, of course, some families were large and they moved on. Uh, some of the children, but I think a lot of it had to do with their acquaintances, I, I would think. Um, they may have heard about land. I, I know uh, people migrate, they do that. When I was a kid, I grew up in Western North Carolina, in Rutherford County, a little place called Ellenboro, between Forest City and Shelby. But my dad got a job at Newport News, Virginia. So we moved up there in 1951. I was in the second grade, I think. Uh, and uh, we, we got up there, and we had relatives coming to stay with us for, for job opportunities, too, at Newport News. We had my uncle, uh, my cousin, and, and there was a little community up there of people from Western North Carolina, and maybe some from South Carolina, too. 
Some of them stayed, and some like us, I guess, got homesick and came back. That's the way I look at it. They, they knew about it from friends, relatives. And of course, there was good land available too. Land really cool, cool people, especially the Scotch Irish. Were, were the grants given to uh, the Revolutionary War soldiers in South Carolina? Yes. Just oh, yeah, yeah. lots of us. Yes. Okay, so, so that was being offered both west and south. Yeah. There's a place over in Oconee County called Bounty Land. I think that was, I'm not sure if I have the right idea, but I think it was probably the, from the bounties or given to, and um, maybe another reason for that, the Revolutionary War soldier. Uh, I belong to the SAR and we mark the Patriot's grave up near Strawberry Hill, Lieutenant Daniel Gilbert. He was from Virginia. But after the war, he received a land grant down here, and he moved to South Carolina to farm. Mm -hmm. People. So there was a, a lot of the Revolutionary War soldiers came here from other states. Oh yes, uh -huh, they did. Yes, I could probably, I can't think of any right now, but there were others. Um, by the way, I was in uh, Old Providence ARP Presbyterian Church near beyond uh, yeah, going towards Stanton, Virginia, and I saw somebody there who was in the Battle of Cowpens. He fought for the Rockbridge Rifles. So I think they must have had to come down with Daniel Morgan with his riflemen, you know, because he wouldn't have been down here fighting uh, otherwise at Cowpen. Did you have questions? Yeah. Is are parts of the wagon road still visible? It looked like in that picture you had that, that it was, sort of like parts of the Natchez Trace. I, I think there are parts that are still visible. There are places up in the Valley of Virginia in the woods. Now, a lot of times when there's construction or something, you know, or farming, it can destroy the uh, trail. But there are places where it still exists. Sometimes it's a secondary road. Like, I think there's one uh, in this book here, it's a dirt road uh, in the Valley of Virginia somewhere. Ruts 
and from the wagon wheels still exists. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah, that's a lot of that stuff just stays. I think there's more areas like that that we know it's on private property and yeah. people are not on right, right, right. property. Right. I I've, I've traveled the Cherokee Path. I don't know, some of you know where uh, the Ruston Grits and Groceries is going down beyond Belton. And the, the trail came through Creightonville and Anderson County. And I looked over in the woods there and I think I see something. Cherokee Path, which which became a wagon road, you know. I may be it may be another road or another path, but you know, it's hard to tell. There are places. Uh, any other questions? I just want to thank you. Have you been to Phoenixville, Pennsylvania? Pardon? Are you familiar with Phoenixville, Pennsylvania? Phoenixville? Yeah, that's where one of the wagon trails goes through. Yeah. And uh, I believe that went east to west. But actually, they have a park there and everything else about that. I never been to the park, but I'm familiar with it. I'm not familiar with that area. You're not? Okay. I'm familiar with Gettysburg uh, okay. area, and uh, I've been in that area a lot. So, okay. um, uh, so but I, I'm part of a major, well, all I know is it was a major area at one time. It must have been an inn or something there in Phoenixville. Phoenixville? Well, Pennsylvania. I'll try to look it up. Okay. Okay. There's should now. Just thinking, I grew up in western New York State in the Iroquois Nation, the Seneca uh, settlements where, where I lived. And the Seneca used to come to South Carolina and fight the Catalans. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, if you're going to have an away game, why couldn't you go to Ohio? You know, I mean, it's <laughs> been a lot closer. I mean, the idea that they would travel, yeah. you know, from western, I mean, the Great Lakes basically down to South Carolina to get in a fight. <laughs> Travel the Warriors path. But I'll, 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 I'll be gone for a while. You know. Yeah. And, and when the test were over, after the test yeah. was over, yeah. at uh, 1712, yeah, they some of them went back. <coughs> a group of test were eventually went back. Yeah, they became part of the uh, yeah. Iroquois Nation. Six. They became the sixth, sixth tribe of the Iroquois Nation. They might have traveled. They the, killed a thousand of them in a battle. You couldn't go too far west and you'd have to deal with the Shawnees. So, yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Well, I think we might want to mention something too. If you're interested in uh, Fairview Presbyterian Church, we have a book about that whole area. And oh. uh, Carol and uh, Sherman here yeah. put this book together. Yeah. And so they're on sale tonight. So, uh, so you're welcome to look at these. Also, too. On a Halloween night, we Andy's going to set up a, a booth over there at Heritage, Pre at Heritage Park. So he's probably going to need some help. So if you would mind seeing him and uh, contacting him about something by helping him out over there. So thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me.